We're going to continue to look at the South and the slavery controversies, 1793 to 1860. This second part is going to look at resistance and eventual the abolition movement. So early on, there's some of the early advocates to end slavery from the free black population I included David Walker, who was more radical, and these were guys, these guys were more radical, more extreme, saying that just changing the laws isn't going to do it. Nobody wants to change the laws. This we need action now, and so he advised the black population to fight for freedom. Don't wait until you get it. Freedom needs to be seized, and not just asked for, because they've already been asking for a while. And in the case of Denmark Vesey, which we talked about in class. He planned a slave revolt in South Carolina in 1822, and it would have been a pretty big one. Um, however, before it could start, he was captured, tried, and executed before he could really get this moving. And so we had constant slave rebellions going. It's not like they were just sitting idly by. They weren't happy as slaves. There were constant attempts to start larger rebellions about every 10 to 20 years. We got a big one, and we also got constant minor rebellions. Uh, another big one was, about 10 years later, was Nat Turner. Uh, he was a preacher who led an 1831 slave rebellion. In this event, about 60 whites were killed. Okay, however, it was put down. Turner, his followers, and many innocent slaves were captured, accused of being part of this rebellion, and over 200 were killed in retaliation. And so don't just note that 60 whites were killed, but also 200 were killed in retaliation. And so it's, and publicly I'd mentioned that this was all meant to say, hey, hey, don't be like Nat Turner or this will happen to you. Every time there was one of these major slave revolts, there's definitely a lot of backlash. And Southern states would create slave codes to tighten limits on the black population trying to prevent further rebellion and to pass all these laws saying okay you're not allowed to go out at night you're not allowed to meet in groups you're not allowed to learn how to read and in many cases free African Americans as well as slaves would lose these rights each time there was a rebellion their rights would be more and more restricted <clears throat> so not just rebellions but also runaways and so free blacks in the north and white abolitionists developed a secret network of people who would hide fugitive slaves in the north. And it's it's worth noting that this is just in the north. This is not a southern thing. If people were caught doing this in the south, right, they'd be killed. And so it's up to the slaves to get out of the south. Once they're in the north, they're not necessarily safe. And that they're still fugitives. Their masters can still cross state lines and capture them. And that people are still looking for them in the north. The only way for them to be truly safe is to leave the country completely. And so escape would mean traveling at foot at night to avoid these armed patrols of slave catchers. And that there were, again, no network in the South. This is a Northern thing. They have to be on their own to escape the South. So there's a lot more runaways along the Southern to Northern border. But those in the Deep South, they're gonna have a much more difficult time escaping because they have to go through the whole South. The people that were helping to, hey, Right. On the Underground Railroad are known as conductors. They would hide the runaways in tunnels and cupboards, anywhere in their house sometimes, hey, during the day so that they can run at night and avoid these slave catchers. Around 100,000 people escaped between 1800 to 1865. Now, it's romantic to say that they were all, all runaways were able to get out, but that's just not the truth. The vast majority that ran away were caught punished and returned to slavery. It was a small amount of people that were actually able to escape. Most got caught. And here we see a map of the different paths to freedom. And the vast majority are going north to Canada. They're getting out and right, traveling through different ways. And then once in the north, they're going to use the Underground Railroad to get out. And so the vast majority are going to go along the rivers, going to hide somehow in these rivers, uh, in boats, however they got to do it, to get out. And in some cases, they'll even escape in other ways and escape to other places that have made slavery illegal. And so in some cases, they're moving to Mexico or in some of the British colonies in the Caribbean right, to escape to freedom. But the vast majority are going to Canada. 
Uh, the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad is Harriet Tubman, and it's odd that she's most famous as conductor because she is not your average conductor. The average conductor doesn't actually go into the South, grab the slaves, and take them North. She is the exception, and it's part of why she is a badass, and that she is one of the really the only person to actually go do this and to risk her life 19 times. And so she escapes herself. And then she says, I'm going to do this for others as well. So she makes 19 trips to the South, frees over 300 slaves, including her own parents, and never loses anybody on these trips. And you, can, you should definitely read more into her. A full life, so beyond her role there, she lives a full life. In the Civil War, she's a cook, she's a nurse, she's a spy. After the, after the war, she pushes for suffrage, the women's right to vote. She pushes for civil rights and lives a long, full life. Uh, one of the other questions for abolitionists was, okay, if they do get freedom, what happens next? And so one of the ideas early on was resettlement, going back to Africa. And so in the early movement, the 1820s, there were over 100 anti-slavery societies that said the solution is go back to Africa. And that northerners, even a lot of abolitionists, had their own racism. And they said, yes, we don't like slavery, but as far as free blacks in the north, we're not ready for that either. And so in one case, they even started a slave, a former slave colony, and it became the country of Liberia. It was founded during the presidency of James Monroe, so the capital of Liberia is Monrovia. And the country really starts off as this. However, it wasn't that successful. Most free blacks didn't want to go back to Africa. They didn't learn, they didn't know the language anymore. They didn't feel African anymore. They were American. And so very few actually emigrated back to Africa. They were American. They wanted to stay in America. A large inspiration for this movement was the Second Great Awakening, which was a religious revival. And it pushed slavery as a sin. And so we got this wave of Protestant religious revival from 1790 to 1840. We got a few different branches of Protestantism rise up and some new churches created. And so hey, this, this rise in Christianity hey, really pushed the abolition movement and led to some new people, such as the Grimke sisters, but also William Lloyd Garrison was one of the more radical white abolitionists. He founded the New England Anti-Slavery Society, as well as the overall American Anti-Slavery Society. Most famous for, in 1854, he went out in public and burned a copy of the Constitution, calling it a covenant with death, an agreement with hell. Multiple times he, he was attacked. He had his own newspaper called The Liberator, called for immediate emancipation, called for freeing of the slaves, and that he was ready now. And so he's more radical. He's not saying, let's slowly free the slaves. Let's slowly push Congress to pass laws. He's saying, no, do it now. This is a horrible thing we're doing. We need to fix it now. And so much more radical in his views. Even when the Civil War comes along and the South splits apart, he says, fine, good riddance. We don't want them. And so much more radical than a lot of the other abolitionists. And he's pretty extreme in his views. He worked with Frederick Douglass. And moving on to Frederick Douglass. And so, former slave, Douglas was taught to read and write by his owner's wife. His owner was likely also his father. Douglas escaped, as that he was on a border state, so it was a bit easier for him to escape. And once he escaped, he moved to England for a while, eventually earned enough money to buy his freedom and could come back to America, where he was asked to lecture for the Anti-Slavery Society. His most famous speech, we'll look at in class later, is his 4th of July speech in 1852 where everybody was celebrating the 4th of July, celebrating being an American, and he says, that's nice, that's not for me. I don't really get to celebrate being an American because of all the problems we still have to work on. He has his own newspaper, the North Star, and he is less radical. Now, you, it would be easy to understand that if he, was, if he was radical, but however, he was much more of a moderate, saying we don't need revolution, we can't just end slavery now, Let's change the laws. And so he says, let's change the laws through political action. So he pushes Congress and he works with Lincoln to change the laws. And again, he has a full life. He pushes Lincoln 
right, to include black troops. Even his son fights in the war. He helps to recruit black troops during the war. And after the war, he pushes for women's rights and the women's right to vote. <clears throat> Speaking of Sojourner Truth, she was a freed black woman who fought for black emancipation as well as women's rights and the right to vote at the same time. And she did this famously in her 1851 anti-woman speech, pushing her white audience saying, if you're going to give white women to the vote, why am I not getting the right to vote? Ain't I a woman? Hey, we should push for both, ending slavery and women's equality at the same time. And so she's really fighting two wars at once. <clears throat> John Brown, oh, crazy John Brown. The most extreme of the abolitionists, who says the only way we're going to do this is through war. Let's start a war. He pushes for an armed slave rebellion in the form of the Haitian slave rebellion. He was definitely inspired by the Second Great Awakening, a very religious man, interpreted the Bible that war is necessary and that killing those that believe in slavery is absolutely justified. Executions are justified if they were slavers. And so in 1856, he moves to Kansas and starts to murder five slave owners in Kansas hey, with his family. His sons are in it with him, and they're just chopping slave owners to pieces. And after that, he becomes a fugitive of the law. People start to hunt him down. And so he starts the war four years early in 1856 in Kansas, where back and forth, slave owners and hey, anti-slave owners start to kill each other with the help of John Brown. 1859, he really starts to get this movement, and he leads a group of men, including his sons, there's 21 men, and so some of the other radical abolitionists. He even tries to get the help of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass says, no thanks, I'm not as radical as you. But he does get money from a lot of the hey, abolitionists up north, and so he gets support and guns from northerners to start this. And so his plan is to go to Harpers Ferry, Virginia, where the U.S. Army has a whole bunch of weapons in their arsenal there. So he attacks it in the middle of the night, gets all these weapons, and then he gets stuck. He gets stuck in the arsenal, so he's got tons of weapons, but then he's surrounded by the U.S. Army. And so 21 guys versus the U.S. Army, they lose. Brown is captured, tried, and executed. And so he tries to start the war early by getting weapons for slaves, but it doesn't work out for him. And so he's a little bit of ahead of his time. Ahead of his time. Some of the writers, and so some less radical people, and then some people are trying to change people's minds. And she, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe here, very much does this. In 1852, she publishes her influential novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin where it's, or Life Among the Lowly, and it's a non-fiction novel that stresses the moral evil of slavery, and it just kind of tells the story of a family that's enslaved and how horrible they're treated. And this really hits people's hearts, and they, they start to realize, oh, slavery is pretty bad, and so it sells all over the North. It's an instant bestseller selling 500,000 in 1857, and it really pushes the abolitionist movement and abolitionist protest increases as people start to see how bad it is down south and so harriet beecher stowe is really credited with pushing this movement further another movement that didn't work as well was this southern movement and so hilton helper was a non-aristocrat he wasn't rich from north carolina and he wrote the impending crisis of the south and uh, pretty much everybody hated this book uh, but he used economic ideas. He used data to show this is a bad idea. And so this is a southerner looking at the data saying, eventually, this is going to be bad economically. Eventually, slavery is not going to work economically. We need to get rid of slavery and start to pay the workers. Then you'll make more money. And everybody hates this. Slavers hate this. Blacks hate this because it attempts to use statistics to prove that non-slaveholding whites were the ones who suffered the most from slavery. And so kind of the poor whites that can't afford slaves, that it was hurting them the most. Because why pay for the whites when you can just buy blacks? And so he's using this argument and it just ends up angering everybody. And uh, 
using just raw data, it makes sense as far as how slavery was hurting the white population when it comes to economics and job prospects. But in the end, nobody liked this. And so it did not do as well to really push the abolitionist movement. That's it.